Hey, it's Coach Nick Timonello here. I'm coming to you live in color with my good friend, Mark Comerford. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I appreciate you being here, man. We're here in Chicago. I'm here for one of Mark's workshops. I follow this guy pretty much wherever he goes when he's local. Um, some of the information I bring to you guys, I get straight from him. So anytime he's in town and I have the time to go see him, I definitely go. So we were uh, just at the bar. As you can see, we have a few beers here. And uh, we were talking about a few controversial topics that have come up lately, um, unbalanced or uh, unstable base training. We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, but for right now, in this video, we're going to talk about lumbar flexion. You know, I had a little debate slash conversation with uh, Charlie and Mike Worrell, one of the Strength Coach podcasts, and Mark had some, some great points that he made. Before we get into this, I let him get, there's going to be no bashing of anyone here. This is very neutral. This is just discussion and learning. So Mark has some great points that he made to me, so I said we got to get it on film. So here we are, and uh, I'll let you, let you take it. Thank you. Know, yeah. So nuts. Um, yeah, so I believe there's a bit of a debate about whether um, flexion is dangerous to train with. Um, have I got that right? Yeah. Is that the question? Yes. Well, yeah, whether yeah. you should use exercises like reverse crunches or inch yeah. A lot of coaches are just cutting those things out right now and saying you shouldn't, you shouldn't flex the spine at all, basically, when you're doing exercise. Yeah, well, when we think about the spine, my background is not so much strength conditioning, it's more rehab and re reconditioning for sport. So you get people back where you guys can, you know, can put, the, put the final loading touches on them. Right. But you know, a lot of the things that the, the lumbar spine is, has joints that are oriented this way, so they're designed to flex and extend. That's, that's, their, that's their architecture, that's their shape, that's their, their mechanism of movement. So lumbar spine is designed to flex. And the other thing, the disc, it's in between every lumbar vertebra. Its job is, is, is a force transducer. It's designed to transmit force and to deal with compression. That's its job is it's a compression structure. And so when we keep the discs don't have a circulation, so what keeps them happy and healthy is cyclical compression. Sure. Okay. And they need to rock backwards and forwards and, the, and, the, and to sort of move fluid dynamics through across the disc. So the disc is designed to compress and it's designed to flex and extend. That's, it, that's what it's designed and meant to do. Flexion is a functional movement. We, we flex all the time. Now one of the things that um, I, I keep coming across all the time now is the idea that well should we train the flexion? You know, like we can move into flexion and in most functional movements we talk about flexion being lowered forward by the back instead of working in center. Sure. Okay. But that's low that's low force function and that's what we see in a lot of the rehab environments. And that's not controlled very well. Right. So in the rehab environment we see flexion being uncontrolled by inefficient back extensive stabilizers. But in a sporting environment, there are so many things where we actively flex. You know, like you don't play a contact sport and not deal with impact. And you don't in a contact sport where you are taking making a tackle, you're trying to pull someone down to the ground. Then, then you, you've got to flex. You can't do that with the back extension. You've got to use a front flex as the other one to pull someone down. Now, in Olympic wrestling and stuff like that, I can see where you might be holding someone down. But in, in all combat sports, you're going to do that. Anytime you push anything down, the trunk flexes are going to flex, flex the spine under 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 resistive load. Absolutely. And this is kind of what a lot of people talk about. You know, well, if there's difference when you talk to MMA or, or football. But in all any sport where there's contact, any basically any time you're forcefully driving anything downwards you're getting some sort of, of flexion movement. So, you know, a lot of people say, well, in standing, the rectus abdominis and abdominals don't truly flex the spine. Well, yes, when I bend forward, that's given for free by gravity. They eccentrically, you know what I mean, extension. resist extension. That's, but that's not only the only function they have. If I grabbed Mark and just wanted to pull him towards me, I would have to use a flexion moment to do that. So, so let's discuss a couple of functional things in sports that use spinal flexion. Right. One is if you've got to take a block or tackle and you've got to pull someone down. That's flexion. If you do block or tackle, then you are, the aim of a block or tackle is to protect yourself while you having the greatest momentum. There's a concept of impact. Impact is the is, 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 is generating momentum, so velocity over time, so speed exactly. and force. And then as you generate momentum, if you've got to hit something, that's impact. You know, if you hit something soft, the impact is low. If you hit something that's hard, like a wall, the impact is high. Now, if we've got flexion, and there's flexion in that impact, now, if you've got two players who are wanting to create the greatest impact, right, and you want to hit the other player so he takes impact, not you, you want to have the momentum. So we need to condition those tissues that are going to flex and deal with impact at the same time. Absolutely. So conditioning tissues to deal with flex and impact, okay, can't be trained. Can't, 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 it can't be sort of just built with functional movements. You've got to train it in. So that's one thing. Another thing where flexion is used in a dynamic 
velocity based ways is if you are involved in the throwing activity, if you're going to reach behind you and throw forward. You use the trunk rotators, the flexors of the trunk, the abdominals, to power that rotation. You use tension in the thoracic lumbar fascia, but you also wind up and you rotate with the core rotators. The abdominals, the rotation abdominals, and some of the back rotators. But when you lean back to throw, in a, in a lot of throwing sports, if you extend the truck to throw, you've got to use flexors as part of that developing acceleration and momentum of the throwing arm through the truck. And the other place where you use flexion in sporting environments is to, if you have to flex the hip. So if you are going to do a leg drive up to jump, to get maximum momentum height, you drive the leg, and that flexing hip will cause the pelvis, the posterior tilt, and you induce flexion loading into the low, at least the lower two lumbar vertebrae at speed and with, with, and with force. No dynamic active truck flexion exercises. Um, this brings up a good point. And we're, we're down here at the, obviously this is kind of late at night here, we're at the hotel tomorrow he's teaching, so we're just bringing this to you kind of candid here. We're down here in the lobby, so you're going to get some background noise. But what I wanted to ask you was this. Um, if I were to jump up and let's say do a, a jump with a knee tuck, yeah. which is obviously lumbar flexion. Or jumping up onto a box. Or jumping up onto a high box where I had to, you know, bring yeah. my knees higher and my hips and really flex it. Would you say that, you know, physiologically or biomechanically or whatever terminology you want to use different than maybe having to do doing a reverse crunch? Uh, yeah, because that, well, it is, in, it is in a way, but they're both using the same muscles and just in different, in different parts of the arms. Right. So if you, whether you lead it, whether the, the pelvis and legs are point of fixation, and then the, the trunk is coming up, or whether the trunk is a point of fixation, the legs are going up and down, it's just working from opposite, opposite origin assertion. Okay. But they're effectively the same muscles, doing the same, putting the same mechanical loads. It's just where do you provide the point of fixation, where does the movement go, it goes from opposite ends. Now, where would you would you say that if someone, let's say, um, wanting to increase, for whatever reason, obviously we want to increase vertical jump, so we're, we're literally looking at touching an object, but let's say I wanted to jump to a higher box or just get better at you know, knee tuck jumps yeah. for whatever reason. Um, would you say that? What, well, I guess I'll rephrase the question. What what purposes would you give for a healthy athlete to do flexion exercises like a reverse crunch or even a regular sit up or a fist ball sit up or a flexion based exercise? What reason would you give a healthy athlete? Well, a couple of reasons. One is to the mu there's two reasons. One is to provide the power you need for the activity, and the other is to provide protective control of that activity. Okay. Okay. So if you're going to be doing, um, so what the trunk flexors can do for us, they can provide protective control of excessive extension or uncontrolled extension or loaded extension. And so when we go to extend or speed, we want to have something to decelerate that extension. So from a rehab perspective, and in dealing with extension-based injuries to mechanisms, we need to train the abdominals as the extension control muscles. Now that has to be built in. That has to be reconditioned as part of a, a movement retraining program. Because people who've got a problem with that often don't do it well. Right. And, but we also need to look at the velocity or the load-based functions of, of shortening to produce that. And so, again, for jumping, we need to get people to do anything to activate those muscles and, and mix it up, make it. Structured, make it non-structured, make it functional. So doing things where we support the trunk and do reverse crunches, support the legs and do normal crunches. You know, like do things where you pull down, like you can do that pull downs and pull all the way down, and 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 and, and make that drive go right through to the ground as as a functional exercise. If you're going to be playing a tackling sport, yeah. we need to be able to teach people to keep the spine as neutral as possible, but deal with non-neutral positions. Like you can't function without non-neutral positions. And one of the things that in my rehab training program, we, we have to deal with in terms of conditioning people back to getting back to functioning and coping with sport as a, as a training tool, is we need to teach them, okay, outside of the normal little boxes, we need to sort of do a structure and then move it into function back, functional integration, but we need to teach people to activate these muscles in loaded ways, to deal with Absolutely. impact, to deal with, you know, like, and one of the things I see in terms of reconditioning this, this is our problem worldwide. And you know, like, so if we think about how do we recondition ankles that are sprained, the ligaments are damaged, but we, we, we protect them from end of range, stress and strain, but we load them in mid range and, and point of propagation so that when the healing collagen, the healing structures, when we lay down new collagen as healing tissue, we all heal with collagen. Discs too, they just do it more slowly because they're not so vascular. But when you heal, the disc heals, it lays down new collagen. You want that collagen to be lined up with the normal cross hatched annular fibers. Okay, because otherwise you're going to have a weak link in the disc. It's going to have, it's like the tire with a bulge in it. Like, you know, like so when you are rehabbing discs, 
If you don't teach them to deal with compression and condition that compressive loading in, if you don't, and you want to do it in a control way, you don't want to, and you need to teach them to deal with flexion and extension. Like not all discs are provoked by flexion. There's a significant amount of research data that shows that the annular tears and the anterior annulus are all due to extension-based translation, shearing, when you extend, not just flexing. So if you want to, if you want to protect the disc, don't extend either. <laughs> if, if, if the whole idea is protect the disc, if I don't going out of neutral, and don't extend either because that's just as bad for a lot of discs. Yeah, and then basically what you're saying is you might as well just wear a, a brace and not and not move at all, and that seems where it's just a scary situation. So we're going to leave it here. Uh, Mark and I are going to come back with another video clip, and we're going to talk about some specific disc issues, and uh, we're also going to talk about unstable base training. So stay tuned.